I know, I know. This was a big file. The download took a long time. iTunes is mad at me. I think it'll be worth it. Welcome to the Renaissance Woodworker, episode number 36. This week, I complete the installation on my Benchcrafted Invite. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. As the intro, and as you saw on the download, this is a larger file, and I debated actually breaking it into two and making this a three-part series. But frankly, I, I got a lot of emails and a lot of requests from people about, hey, when are you going to finish the install? I'm really enjoying this, or thinking about getting one myself. And So, you know, I figured, why not? Let's just go ahead and do it in one more episode. Plus, Safety Week is coming up the week of March 4th, and I wanted to make sure that I had that week open to... Um, present all the ideas I have for safety week and not leave you hanging for an extra week on this uh, Benchcraft installation. And speaking of Benchcrafted, you need to go on over to the Benchcrafted website and check out their newest product. They've just released a brand new leg vise. They call it the Glide leg vise. And uh, Jamil's actually put up some video footage of this thing in action. And I got to tell you, Jamil, you're killing me here, buddy. I've got my uh, wooden screws from Big Wood Vice already ready to go, and I've actually started mortising the nut into the leg. And then you come out with this leg vise that just looks awesome. But, oh well, I'm going to be just happy with my uh, wooden screws. But I tell you, for the rest of you out there, strategizing on building your next bench, take a very close look at this. And I'll put a link in the show notes to this. This is an amazing product, and uh, kudos to the folks over at Benchcrafter for continuing to push the envelope and pushing out uh, really, really high-quality merchandise. And uh, in other news, uh, head on over to the um, Sawdust Chronicles. The 30-day build challenge is about to kick off. I believe it's scheduled to start on May 1st. So if you haven't gotten your entry in, you got to get in there before May 1st if you want to take part in this. I think Rick and Eric have gotten uh, quite a few entrants, and it looks like it's going to be a really good contest. So make sure you head over to the Sawdust Chronicles. I'll include a link to that as well. Without further ado, let's jump down to the shop and let's finish up the installation of the Benchcrafted Invice. I've read in several places that placing your dog holes closer together is always going to be much better in the long run. So I struck a, a bunch of lines three inches apart all the way down the board, and I'm just going along with a square here and uh, you know, crossing those lines to make little X's centered on the dog block. The dog block is one and three quarter inches wide. And uh, just double checking my measurements there. And then I'll come back along with a scratch all and just dimple each one of those X's that will allow me to line it up with a Forstner bit. My, uh, the quill on my drill press only has a two and a half inch travel, so that three quarter inch Forstner bit only got me a little more than halfway through, but it gave me a good guidance hole to use the brace and bit. So I've got a nicely sharpened three quarter inch auger in here and uh, quickly discovered just how hard it was to drill through this, this ash. Um, a lot of it is the, the throw on or the travel on the brace is I think about five inches really just too narrow for this big of a job you need probably more like a 10 inch travel in order to get the kind of leverage you need so I was constantly drilling in and kind of backing it out and drilling it in I managed to do three holes this way when I realized that you know I was going to twist my own arm off and needed to come up with a better solution so pulled out a three quarter inch spade bit and that certainly ate through it pretty quickly and with a long leading point on the spade bit I was able to use the blue tape and mark out just enough so that that leading point would penetrate the other side and then um, once I took the clamps off and was able to flip it over there would be just the tiniest little bit of a hole sticking out the other side. Um, I did use two clamps just to prevent any kind of twisting motion as I um, you know, was drilling. So I put the clamps back on and then go back over with the bit and brace and using that little starter hole uh, be able to to drill out the the bottom waist there and you'll see here it was uh, really a lot easier this way and I really like the the clearance hole that the auger created it was much cleaner entry so I just chose to, to use that to you know penetrate through from the other side um, 
probably in the future I would leave just a little bit more meat on the other side of the hole so that the leading screw that actually pulls the auger and the spur into the, the wood would have a little bit more to grab onto. So I had to push a little bit more just to get it, get it biting into it. So I used that process all the way down the board and then went back with my uh, wireless trim router here and uh, using a quarter inch chamfer bit just put probably about an eighth, maybe three sixteenth of an inch chamfer on each one of the holes. And it's guided by the bearing, so it was a pretty efficient way to quickly go through. I went ahead and chamfered both sides of the dog block just to prevent any chance of chip out as I'm running a, a, a dog through or any of those wonder dogs or anything like that. And once this was over, it was time to glue it in place. This was a little bit more precise glue up than I dealt with before. It needed to be um, perfectly aligned so that my, my dogs didn't get out of uh, perpendicular to the bench top. Also needed to be aligned with the end of the bench crafted cavity. So I decided to use biscuits. And um, you know I don't know why I didn't do that before. Uh, it went so smoothly and so easily, I decided to do it on the next laminate strip. Now I set my dog blocks back uh, far enough so that they wouldn't interfere with the tenons on the legs. So I'm putting this other actually two block strip on top of it and then there'll be another front laminate in front of that that will actually get dovetailed into the end cap. Here you can see kind of a detail of the biscuits. I just put three biscuits, one on each end and one in the middle, to align it and it made it a little bit difficult to align this block. Um, it was just so heavy and uh, had to fiddle with it a little bit to get it perfectly aligned, but using the biscuits on this particular glue up again was good. It kept the the boards nice and flat with one another, but also this was really a precision glue up because I've got the tenon on the end of this block that needs to mate with the end cap. So it was imperative, and you'll see I take up my straight edge here, it's imperative that the end of that block be in line with the rest of the bench so I wouldn't have problems fitting the end cap later. So with a little uh, persuasion using the mallet, um, go back down and check the alignment here. And um, I found that I was pretty close, but what I ran into, and I'll go into this a little bit later, is the actual, the tenon of that shorter block wasn't cut perfectly square. So what I did was line that um, two board strip up uh, as best I could with the end cap or with the main part of the bench so that I would get a, a, a pretty smooth glue up. Now this is a, just an off cut from the dog block and I'm just gonna slide it in there so that uh, when I put clamps in there, I'll make sure that I keep that perfectly parallel. It's um, imperative that that be parallel for the installation of the Benchcraft Advice later. And then it's just onto the clamps. Now that we've got all the tenons cut and everything's glued together and firm, um, I've got my end cap here and I milled the end cap so that it's just a little bit thicker than the bench itself. It's about a sixteenth of an inch too thick and um, I wanted it that way so I've got a little bit of space um, that I can actually flush it to the top later. So I just took an extra piece of plywood and uh, clamped it to the bottom of the bench just to give myself a little bit of a shelf to rest here. The end cap as well is, is too long and I wanted that so that I've just got some space as well to flush it along the edges of the bench. Now of course there's going to be one more laminate that goes on the front here that gets dovetailed into this cap. So I want this a little bit long anyway. I'll cut that once I'm dealing with the dovetail. So knowing that I want it, you know, just just a little bit more meat. Uh, the other thing I'll, I'll look at, I don't know if you can see it, but on uh, the edge of the end cap there's a knot here and a little imperfection. I want to make sure I've got enough room that I can just lop that whole thing off. And that runs to about here. So I've set it up so that I know the front laminate will come to about here. It gives me plenty of room to cut off that imperfection. So setting it on the, um, on the shelf here. Now it's just a matter of taking my pencil and I'll reach in here and mark where those tenons go. And the key is here, just make sure you've got a sharp pencil.
Now comes the hard part. Squeeze in front of the camera here. Sorry about that extreme close-up. Got to get down here underneath. Mark out the bottom. Okay, sharp pencil. Got to reach down in here and scribe this curve. This is the vice cavity that we've hollowed out. This is where having a nice sharp pencil. And you know, if you've got little uh, shop sherpas running around, it's helpful to have little tiny fingers too. Now what I'm not going to be able to do is get onto the bottom side of this tongue. I just can't reach in there the way I've got the shelf in place. But I, I know the measurement there. I can use my compass and transfer that later. So let's go ahead and pull this off. And uh, we can see we've got our tenons marked out here. Taking the distance from the bottom of the bench. Let me take this little shelf out of the way. Using my square. I can capture this distance from the bottom of the bench that was referenced off that shelf. And then Transfer it here. Now it's time to waste away all this material, form these mortises. Um, did most of the work using a router, and I took that same two and a half inch straight bit that I was using to route the, the cavity in the bench itself and used it to put. Um, one and a half inch deep mortise in here. Um, and this was really just, uh, you know, making, I, I think I made about four passes at very, you know, progressively deeper depths in order to get to the very bottom of the, uh, the mortise. I'm referencing off of a fence along the bottom edge there. And if you see, I've actually got two stop blocks um, on the, um, well, your right hand side, you'll see a piece that's just double stick taped to the end cap. And then uh, another piece actually clamped down to the bench using a pair of holdfast, by the way, and uh, that just kept me, you know, in line with the edges of the mortise. As I progressed further um, towards you in this perspective, I did have to change the uh, the stop block a little bit to move further gravity. And uh, just using my square, check the depth, and I went just a little bit deeper than the the one and a half inch, just to give me a little bit of clearance room. Here was just time to pare away uh, the edge. I used typical uh, bench chisels to go ahead and square up the edge on the left there and then on that small square tenon over on the far right. It was really helpful to have um, the really, really wide, firmer chisels here for just paring that away to get a nice uh, smooth face. For the actual curve, I used carving chisels. Um, didn't have a gouge that perfectly matched the, uh, the curve there, so I just used number one sweeps. Um, this is just a straight gouge I was using to refine this. and. Um, really did a, a very good job. It was um, you know, nice and sharp, so didn't use that many mallet wax. Most of it was just hand pressure to uh, refine that to the line. And um, switched over to a skew chisel here to get right into the very corner. Uh, this definitely was, was a little bit more difficult, getting down to that tiny, tiny corner. And uh, you know, it was not as imperative, because obviously there's so little glue surface there that um, in the end, I, I didn't get all the way into the corner, but I ended up trimming just the very tip of the tenon so that I could get in and, and um, remove the majority of it. And, um, you know, whittled away, worked my way slowly down in there until I uh, got the mortise where I liked it, and it was time to go over and uh, test at least the initial test fit. Well, the corners are squared and the mortise is paired. Did a few test cuts, had to pare out a few spots where I could see it rubbing. And uh, let's uh, give it a shot. And 
and it's a nice snug fit, but I've got a small issue here, and uh, yeah, camera can't really make it out. It appears that this front laminate piece over here while it is square to the tongue the actual shoulder of the tongue was not square and hopefully you can see this gap right here and you can see that it actually widens across so I could probably use a shim and fix that but at the same time this uh, this end cap needs to have a really really strong snug fit because uh, the vise is going to be running right through this section here. So I think, yeah, I could shim it and fix it, but I think as an exercise in fixing some errors, what I'll do is uh, set up a fence right here on the bench and remove um, about a sixteenth of an inch all the way across in a straight line to uh, straighten this up completely. Here's my solution to this uh ill-fitting end cap. I've got a, a straight edge clamp in place here on the bench and what I've done is squared it, this fence, up to the end vise. Uh, I actually don't care that much that the end cap be perfectly square to the end of the bench. What's important is that it be square to the slot so that when I install the screw for the Benchcraft advice that it continues to run square and parallel along the, uh, the cavity that's already put in here. It just so happens that um, being square to the slot is going to make it square to the bench because I've made this parallel. But you know, it goes to show you that if for some reason this were, if the slot were not quite parallel to the direction of the bench, it would still be okay as long as I make the end cap square to it. So um, what it's going to do is essentially give me a, a nice straight, consistent line all the way across this tongue just so happens as well that I've got a slight deviation in the depth on the lower uh, part of the bench and the upper part. So by running it across, I'm also going to even up both sides so I don't have a gap. Granted, if I had a gap on the bottom, it's not going to kill me, but this will be even all the way across. Get my hearing protection. straight edge. Just want to double check this. And sure enough, perfectly flat across both of those sections. You notice that as I traversed across here, I pulled away and came in and did a climb cut just to prevent any tear out on this edge and this edge. So let me uh, keep at it. Take a few more uh, progressive cuts in order to get all the way down here. I've got the stop on the router set equal with the tongue here. Let's get back to it. There's the finished cut, and um, you can see this section in here. I actually just pared this away with a chisel. There's actually a few rough spots in there, but to illustrate a little bit what I'm doing, um, right here, you can see where I haven't pared away. I obviously took this cut across, and it's leaving the shoulder a little bit raised in between. Over here, you can see where I've already pared it away. 
and when I fit the end cap just in this section I've got a really tight fit let's see if I can show that off I've got a really good fit there and I'm actually equal on the bottom as well obviously the gap broadens as we move down because the shoulder over here is holding it back so just going to go ahead and, and pair that away and uh, we should be able to get a nice smooth fit uh, all the way across. There we have it. Did a little bit of a uh, pairing in the shoulders there to bring it flush and then on the very end of the tinning I took my shoulder plane and just had to trim off uh, I don't know probably 64th of an inch to get it to fit smoothly all the way across. Uh, I went ahead and trimmed it flush on this end just over at the chop saw and you can see I've got a perfect flush fit all the way across. With the end cap now properly fit it's time to mark out the holes for the captive nuts that will um, cinch up the bolts going into the end cap. So just using a square and reconnecting the lines that I already have on the end cap I will mark out and uh, drill the holes for those nuts. Up in the uh, overlay here you can see I'm actually drawing the, uh, the counterbore for the half inch bolts that go in the end. I'm using five inch long half inch bolts and the mortises on the top will actually that will hold the nuts will be exactly three quarters of an inch. So down on the bottom you'll see I'm drilling the half inch hole to, to house those bolts and then just with a pencil cross the line and you can see X marks the spot where I'll drill out for the nuts, the captive nuts. So now let's uh, get down to business here and uh, using the holes that I drilled in the end cap of the drill press I drill through with a half inch um, auger bit to connect through. Um, I need them to be, those holes to be five inches deep and in the overlay obviously you see I'm drilling the um, three quarter inch hole with a forstner bit to house the, the captive nut. So now um, I've got the three quarter inch holes drilled on the top. I need to square off one end so that the nut has a flat face to register against to cinch the, uh, the bolts in place. And just using a square and a marking knife, I'll go ahead and um, score the lines for the mortises, or at least the, the flat walled mortises, on those um, three quarter inch holes for the nuts. And that's the uh, side wall of the mortise there. And what I'm going to do from here is uh, using a three quarter inch chisel and actually I'll, I'll grab a half inch chisel as well. Just go ahead and uh, you know, flatten out one side here. And originally I had actually hollowed out this mortise just using the three quarter inch chisel. And uh, you know, it was absolutely a perfect fit. It was such a perfect fit that uh, it was really hard to get the three quarter inch nut in there and I was a little worried about being able to position it and maneuver it and not be able to get it back out so I went back over with a half inch chisel and slightly widened the mortise so that I could at least lift the bolt out if needed and uh, be able to position it around. I still had it tight enough that the walls of the mortise held the, held the nut in place so I didn't have to worry about you know, wedging it any somehow so that I could tighten up the bolt. And from here, really, it's just you know repeated wax to uh, get down to that line. I added a little bit more length to that flat wall there, just so that I had enough room to be able to slip a finger down inside behind the nut and um, be able to tell when the bolt was actually threading through, because most of it was really by feel. The holes are small enough that it was hard to really see what uh, what I was doing in there, frankly. So just using this chisel, go ahead and clean out some of the extra stuff along the walls and get the walls nice and flat. And then uh, it's time to vacuum out all the chips and the dust and stuff. And uh, we'll start doing a test fit at this point. Uh, I was able to look down in there and see that the horizontal holes from the end cap did connect through. So I do know that I've got to fit there. Thread the bolt in and kind of whack it in place a little bit with the mallet. And I just wanted to double check how much it protruded through into that mortise. Wanted to make sure that I had enough sticking through that it would thread into the bolt. And you can see even after I widened up the holes of the mortise, the, the nut still is a very snug fit in there.
but uh, it does line up and it does fit nicely and I'm able to um, tighten it up. So here, just using a socket wrench, uh, you can see I stick my finger down in the hole just to get it threading and then I know uh, from there um, the sides of the, the mortise wall actually hold the nut firm and I was able to cinch it up very tightly. So now it's time to actually mark out the um, holes for the screw as well as the flange bolts. And uh, using that saddle square, I connected lines along the cavity over the corner down onto the edge. And I used a, um, a felt tip marker so that it showed up really well so I could actually see it through this sheet of paper that has a template on it. And um, you know, did a little bit of uh, checking just to make sure it was lined up along those lines. You can see the lines I drew across the top of the end cap. They line up with the, the template. And, uh, you know, this is a very, very precise install here, so make sure that you're dead on on those lines. And then using a uh, scratch awl, mark out the center point for the screw and the center point for the two flange bolts on either side of it. And then up in the overlay, you'll see um, I went ahead and started drilling out the hole for the screw. When you do drill the hole for the screw, make sure that you do a, a one and a half inch counter bore before doing the one and an eighth inch hole for the, the screw itself. That way you've got room for the flange nut. So here's a moment of truth. <clears throat> here's the uh, first test fit. I went ahead and screwed on the, uh, the metal handle just for ease of turning it. slides in nicely. Obviously the hole is not meant for structural support um, so it is cut just a little bit a little bit wide for clearance. I'm going to go ahead and thread this into the nut a little so I've got room. Now the template should have perfectly aligned our holes and it has. Washers on. Put these nuts in place. And I'm not going to tighten up those nuts, so the vinyl uh, lock nuts. I'm just going to go ahead and get them where I think they should be and twist the crank and there we go. We've got full clearance. This is basically just testing to make sure that my, uh, my cavity works. And I'm go back the other way. Obviously, you can see the screw going back and forth. It's because I haven't tightened up the nuts yet. But if we go all the way to the end, right, I run out of space there. And I still have, still have a little bit of the screw sticking out. So the length of my cavity is good. I've got clearance. Now, as you can see, the plate is just resting right on the bench. The guide rails will go along either side of it, but I'll be recessing the guide rails so that the groove is actually flush with the top. In other words, the plate will be sitting at the same height that it is now. So I know that it works. I know that my clearance holes are where they need to be perpendicular to the bench. So let's go ahead and uh, route the rails, the grooves to the rails. Uh, we'll install those and we will be good to go. So the first thing I'm going to do is go ahead and set the rails and the sliding plate in place. And I just want to, holding, them f holding the rails flush with the cavity, I want to see that I've got a, a small amount of play side to side in the plate. Um, maybe a sixteenth or a thirty-second of an inch on either side. And then using a scratch hole, I'll go ahead and mark with the grain uh, where the uh, limit of that dado is going to be. 
I switch over to a marking knife just for those cross grain situations. You notice that I'm embedding the rails partially into the end cap, just as a little bit of extra measure to kind of strengthen that joint between the bench and the end cap, since I'll be driving one screw into the end cap as well. And now it's time to uh, route the holes here. I've got the depth stop set at a quarter of an inch, and I'll actually make uh, each one of these in, in a couple of passes. I've got a three quarter of an inch router bit in place here, and really it's just referenced off the fence. And um, very, very slowly go ahead and route out those cavities. Now, if you can look down by the guide, I actually added the front laminate strip. This is the one that's going to be dovetailed in eventually. This is just clamped in place right now because obviously I needed the fence to reference off the edge. And uh, with the end cap overhanging, I wouldn't have been able to route the entire edge because the fence would have bumped into the end cap. So with that front laminate just clamped in place, now I can actually slide the fence around the end cap without any problems. And this was, this was important that this be exactly the same depth. So again, use, uh, your, use your depth stop here to make sure that you're routing these parallel and at the same depth to one another. And once I got the uh, second cavity routed, it was time to get out the chisels and square up the ends. And this is just, you know, standard practice. I will uh, use my chisels just to lightly define the edges of these mortises. And that's usually just one light tap. And then from there, it's just go in and easy passes, kind of pair away back to that line that you just set with that light tap. Helps to have sharp chisels, of course, too. So now um, I got out my router plane, and I just wanted to make sure that the bottom of that groove was perfectly flat. And setting that router plane to the exact same depth allows me to ensure that both of these grooves are going to be at exactly the same depth. So just a couple passes with the router plane on both sides and uh, kind of cleaned up the bottom. It's amazing every time I use um, a router and when I go back it over with a router plane, how I discover that that groove is not perfectly flat. And with the precision of this vise, I really wanted it to be perfectly flat. So here's the first fit of the rails and um, it's definitely a snug fit and uh, let me get the um, sliding plate here and the other rail and you'll discover that you know you have to actually remove the entire assembly slide the plate into those grooves and then insert them into the grooves because the fit is, is so exact and as you can see uh, I'm actually struggling to get it in there and I think um, the end of the mortise uh, on the far rail up by the end cap is just a little bit too snug and I can't get it to seat really really well so I'm just gonna have to probably go back in there with a chisel and uh, clean that up just a little bit so sure enough let's remove all the hardware out of the way and um, get back in there with a chisel and, and loosen that fit just a little bit now let's try it again slide the plate into the rails and definitely a snug fit. That's what you want. You don't want any slop at all in these rails. And you see I've actually got to kind of whack them into place. But the key is here that they seat firmly. Um, they're bedded directly against the bottom of that groove all the way along their length. That way there's no movement at all. So once I actually mark and tighten up these screws, they're not going to move. And as you can see, plenty of... Uh, easy play uh, along that groove. The plate slides very nicely just like it's supposed to. So let's uh, thread the screw back in and uh, once we tighten up the screw um, it's time to adjust the fit and make sure that it does continue to roll uh, or slide perfectly smoothly. Okay now that I've got the ends of the uh, rail mortises squared I've set everything in place and I was uh, getting a little bit of binding um, and I think what had happened as, as I was using a router plane to level these grooves maybe uh, I'd gone just a little bit too deep on this end so I took a couple of um, 1 32nd inch shims of just ash material and I shimmed on this very on this side of it and now the 
mechanism runs beautifully. Absolutely smoothly, no binding anywhere. Am um, I still getting a little bit of side to side movement? That'll be controlled by the actual dog block as it rides in the slot. But as you can see, very little effort is required to, to turn this. It moves along nice and smoothly. So um, if you do see or experience any kind of binding, if the mechanism takes any, really any effort at all to move it, you need to shim something or correct an angle or something like that. Um, it is imperative that the screw be installed perpendicular to the bench. So in other words, make sure that the face of your end cap is perfectly square to your bench so that when you're drilling into it, that screw references along the length here. So now that this is all shimmed in place, I'm gonna uh, mark out the holes, drill them, and install the screws, and um, all that's left is the dog block. Well, the installation is pretty much complete. I just have to mill and uh, rabbit a dog block to uh, screw into the actual mechanism here, and uh, we'll be all set to go. Um, what I, I had to do a, a little bit of fiddling here in this final step when it came to actually screwing down the rails. Um, I checked and double checked and made sure that the, um, the slots, the mortises for the rails were of the same depth and, and perfectly parallel and all that. But um, one word of advice before you actually do that routing part, make sure that you flattened the bottom of the bench or at least the part where this is going in. Um, the, the bench is, is relatively flat, but it does have a, um, a convexity to it, a hump to it. And um, I didn't even think about that. I routed the rails, and while inspecting each rail individually, I discovered that they were the same depth and parallel. What I discovered was that in the curvature of the bench, this rail and this rail, instead of them being the same depth, were just a little bit canted like that, just the tiniest bit, but this is a pretty precision install, and that little bit of cant caused some issues there. So I, I had to do a little bit of shimming, and, and frankly, it took me a couple of hours just kind of futzing around with it and putting a shim in here and tightening down the screws. And the key is, is you can clamp the, the rails down um, or tighten the screws down. Make sure that the rails are, are tight in place when you test it because it may be running smoothly and then you go and tighten it and they move just a fraction of an inch and suddenly it's tight again. The mechanism should move very, very smoothly. You know, as I said before, really no effort at all to get this thing to move. Um, you know, it even sounds smooth when it's lined up right. So um, how I handled this was I actually had a, a piece of ash lying around and uh, on my, my table saw, using a feather board, using a push stick, a uh, splitter in place and all that stuff, made a bunch of 32nd uh, inch shims. And actually, I, I cut one a little bit thinner, which was probably not quite 64th of an inch, but somewhere in there. And um, using just this stack, really, of these shims, I was able to kind of cut and, and get them where I wanted and position the shims around the screws. And really, just by kind of twisting the, working the handle and by kind of, well, I'm binding here and kind of lifting up on the rail just a little bit and saw that the binding stopped. So then I stuck a shim in there until it worked and until finally everything was very, very firm and I tightened down the screws and I, I saw no give whatsoever in the rails as I tightened those screws down. And, and that really was it. So now everything runs perfectly smoothly. So um, I'll go ahead and make the dog block, install that, and um, we'll come back. Okay, I'm about to melt the dog block. I just want to check one quick thing. I've advanced the, uh, the plate all the way to the end here and I'm going to check the height of the cavity on both sides, just ensuring that you know, we're parallel, but also to get a dimension for my dog block. And I'm coming in uh, right at, well, just a little under three and three quarters. Let's pull the vice back. Notice I flipped the bench over, obviously. Pull the vise all the way back to this end until it butts up against the hub. 
Let me check measurements back here. And same measurement there. So we'll cut our dog block to uh, three and three quarters. I'll leave us just a little bit proud of the bench top and I can just plane that flat once I get it installed. So the parts for my sliding dog block are actually just cutoffs from the original dog strip. So they are exactly the same diameter or thickness as that uh, long dog strip, but I, you know, I don't want it to wedge inside the slot. So I needed to just trim it ever so slightly to, to ride nice and uh, cleanly in that slot. So I get to actually put my dog strip to use. In the overlay, you can see I'm actually laying out the rabbit that will fit over the top of the angle iron. And it just kind of covers it up. It's more of an aesthetic thing that it will butt up against the end of the, the cap there. So using my smoothing plane, uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and take a little bit of the thickness off. Probably could have done a little bit faster with a jack plane, but you know, I figured it doesn't need that much to come off. In the overlay, you'll see I'm actually cutting the rabbit on the bandsaw, and this doesn't have to be perfectly precise, but I do want the uh, edge to be flat to ride up against the uh, angle iron on the, um, the screw. So I'll just continue to take very, very light passes. My uh, smoothing plane, you can see I made a couple adjustments there to get it cutting at the right depth. And, it, you know, it's a couple thousandth of an inch thick. You need to round over the bottom corner of the dog block because the angle iron on the screw is actually slightly rounded itself. And I just put a few chamfers on the edge there just for um, ease of use. You can see the hole that's drilled in the back. That actually is a recess for the, the nut that attaches the angle iron to the bolt on the screw. So I'm going to uh, loosen up the Wonder Dog here and uh, check the fit that I've got. Once I had the fit right, I marked out the holes using a um, um, marking pen and then just screwed it into place using the screws provided with the kit. And uh, I'm going to actually move the camera here in a second and get a better angle here. Um, that first fit wasn't quite uh, where it needed to be. The bottom fit nicely, but the top of the block was still just a little bit too thick for it. And, you know, taking very, very light, wispy shavings, thousands, maybe two thousandths of an inch thick, uh, went ahead and uh, trimmed it down just a little bit more. And I'll go ahead and make another test fit. And, and this one should do it. And run it all the way down. Uh, the slot is parallel, but I just wanted to make sure that it was perfectly clean the whole way. Now, I did find that I was a little bit out of square. I didn't pay attention to the actual end of the dog strip. And it didn't perfectly match up with the dog block once it was screwed in place. So I actually used one of my Lee Nielsen face floats to clean it up and get it to uh, perfectly made up. I'll eventually stall leather, which... Well, essentially, that's it. I um, got the dog hole drilled in the uh, in the dog block here, and uh, went ahead and installed it back in after I had rounded over the bottom and uh, drilled the recess for the the flange uh, bolt hole. So now the block is sitting firmly up against the the metal plate. That way, the plate is taking the stress and not the screws. Um, once I got the screws in. Essentially, we're, we're all done. The only really last thing that I'll need to do is I'll line the jaws with leather. And I'll go ahead and stick a piece of leather in here and in here. And, um, you know, as you saw earlier, I just needed to, to align them, make sure that they were perfectly flush when they came closed, and that's what I was using those uh, um, face floats for. But uh, the real test to see if the vise is installed without any binding or any, any issues is, is, is frankly this. And let's uh, get a closer look here. Essentially, oh, you can also see I've installed the, uh, the Coca Blow handle on it, which is much, much more comfortable to work with than that, that metal one. But it moves so smoothly that I can really just spin it like that and it will uh, seat itself. And let me get another dog 
got the board in place and really slide it right there and this is firm. You saw I really you know, just spun it up to it there and it's extremely firm and ready to be worked on the surface. And then just a simple twist, we're out of the way. So need to make a few more passes here uh, with the plane just to get this completely flush to the surface, but I also need to go back over and, and eventually I'll need to completely flatten the top. So I'm not going to worry too much about this right now. I do know that it works. Once I get the top completely flattened, I will um, go ahead and install the leather on the uh, device spaces as well. So this, uh, this install is definitely a, a complex install, required a great deal of precision, a great deal of, of work to make sure that everything lined up just perfectly, everything was square, and that everything ran smoothly. Um, you know, if there was just a little bit of binding, the screw would still work really, really well, but I wanted to make sure that it was as smooth as it was designed to be, and I think that's really the beauty of the, uh, the Benchcraft device, is just how precise and how precision milled the screw and all the, the parts are. You want to install it so that it works as it was intended. Obviously, um, this uh, install may be a little bit different than what you're looking at. Uh, I decided I wanted my dog holes behind the leg so that I wouldn't have to worry about spacing dog holes around the tendon of the leg or some sort of relief hole or something like that. So obviously I still need to glue on the other front laminate and I need to dovetail it into the end cap. I'm debating whether I'm going to do um, half blind dovetails in the end cap or I might do um, through dovetails. I'm not sure what, what that will look like. It might look a little unbalanced seeing as there's only dovetails in one end and not on the other, but I don't know. I'll play around with that and um, you know, we'll probably save that for a separate episode altogether on how to actually dovetail this in when you're dealing with an eight foot long piece. But um, I am really, really happy with the performance of this vise. Um, you know, as of the shooting of this, I've actually spent about an entire day playing around with it and uh, clamping various things, um, clamping things in the jaws like this to, uh, you know, I've done some sawing exercises with it. And, it's just amazing how incredibly firmly it, it holds. Um, I mean, I could literally move the bench in trying to, to break this loose, and this doesn't even have the vice or the, the leather on the, the jaws yet. So um, I know when I put that in, that I'll even increase the, the holding power. So um, rule of thumb, or I guess the lessons learned on this, be extra vigilant when it comes to the preparation of your parts. Uh, when you're dealing with the end cap and the dog block and all that, make sure everything is perfectly square on all six edges. Um, I worked really hard to get the dog strip completely square and then forgot that maybe I needed to worry a little bit about the end and you saw that cost some extra work at the end there where I had to square up the, the end grain with the sliding dog block. Um, some of the problems I ran into in the end cap were I hadn't paid as much attention to the squareness of the end cap and um, obviously if, if the end cap is not square to the bench, then as you drill through, the screw itself may be canted, may be off, the, um, off the, the parallel with the bench, and you'll run into issues where as you move the dog block forward, it will start to rise or it'll lower, so it doesn't matter how much you flush it to the top. So really just pay really close attention to keeping everything square and flat. And, you know, you shouldn't have too many problems installing this. It's a, it's a lot of work and hollowing out the cavity and it's a lot of, uh, um, you know, precise drilling and things like that. But ultimately, you know, you could do this in a weekend. Um, I'm lucky if I get a couple hours each weekend and I, I really took my time because I didn't want to screw it up. So um, I hope that this really helps uh, on how to go through the install on this and uh, I hope that you guys out there watching this will consider purchasing one of these as well. I know this is going to really change how I do uh, handwork on my bench. So thanks for watching. And um, now it's on to uh, actually the joinery and getting the legs and everything assembled onto this. We're pretty much on the home stretch here.